This is uh, an extraordinarily exciting time. Um, I'm just going to start by saying this, this is, I'm talking to the group of people who know that this is the opportunity of our age. I produced this editorial for Science Magazine on January the 8th this year. Basically, why are we saying this is the opportunity of our age? Well, quite simply, as you know, globally, we're talking about an energy industry, which is the biggest industry in the world. It's going to be totally a renewable stroke nuclear industry going forward in time. And that industry is going to therefore create a demand for those products that can deliver energy and heat into the marketplace uh, um, from uh, non-fossil fuel sources amounting to two to three trillion dollars a year by 2020. That's the uh, um, estimate of the infrastructure investment that is going to take place as a result of the nationally determined contributions from 190 countries presented at the Paris meeting. So the first point I want to make is that that Paris meeting has created a surge in market activity over the coming 5, 10, 15 years in this arena, um, such that we have never seen before. So there is a, a, a very big opportunity there. And of course there are frustrations when dealing with international opportunities, and we may discuss that during the discussion period. But I think the, the first point to make is that the G7 agreement on June the 8th last year, the heads of government of the G7 countries saying, we are going to decarbonize the global economy during the course of this century. That went global in Paris. So we are going to decarbonize the, glo the global economy during the course of this century, and I'm going to discuss with you how quickly that has to be done to meet the central agreement reached in Paris. So let's just quickly summarize what happened in Paris. Not only did we have 190 nations with their nationally determined contributions, we also saw the agreements I'm going to run through very quickly now. And the first and most important is that those 197 nations at the meeting agreed that we should aim to stay well below a two degree centigrade temperature rise uh, during the course of this century and beyond, and we should aim to be at 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature rise. Now, the sum of the nationally determined contributions doesn't add up to that. So what we must see in order to meet that agreement is a change in behavior in not the long term, but in the short term. And that's really the main point I want to make. Yes, we, we made this commitment to peak emissions as soon as possible mealy mouthed words, I would suggest, but nevertheless, it's there. And every five years, and I think this is critically important, the review mechanism. We're going to review progress every five years through the United Nations Framework Convention process. And obviously, reviewing progress with a view to matching up what nations are doing against that commitment to the two degrees and possibly 1.5 degrees. The other sections of the agreement deal with financial transfers from the developed to the developing nations. Everyone knows $100 billion a year was agreed to be reviewed uh, uh, in 2025. In other words, the expectation is that it will be reviewed upwards. Of course, if the developing countries join the developed countries as their economies grow, that number may go the other way, but let's, let's watch, watch what happens. Uh, differentiation. And here we reach that, that great puddle that the United Nations Framework Convention keeps walking into, which is the belief that we still have developed and developing nations, uh, a divided world. And that belief doesn't recognize what has already happened in China, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa since 1992. In other words, the, the growth of these emerging powers isn't recognized in that language, but nevertheless, some words were found to agree, to get all parties to agree. And then finally, loss and damage. This does not amount to a loss and damage insurance policy, 
the wording again is relatively soft on that. But let's, let's focus on investment opportunities going forward. I just quickly say, the United Nations Framework Convention is not the only game in town. And we know that over the last 15 years, a tremendous amount has already been achieved. So this isn't a starting point. And I just give you here three examples. I've chosen three examples because I've been quite heavily involved in, uh, in these agreements. Uh, three examples of agreements that were outside the United Nations Framework Convention. So the, the first being the New York Forest Declaration. If we are going to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions during the course of this century, we need more sinks. So we need not only avoided deforestation, we need reforestation on a very large scale. And that New York Forest Declaration, which was led by Britain with Norway and Germany, together with Britain providing the finance, many billions of dollars of finance, says all nations are invited to sign up to this, this is forested nations, and can be recipients of that money. And the commitment is avoided deforestation achieved by 2030, but by that time, reforestation equal to the size of India for the whole planet. Now that reforestation creates a carbon sink which is roughly the total emissions from the United States today. So you can see that as we move towards carbon dioxide neutrality, these growing carbon sinks are a vital part of that process. Expansion of carbon pricing activities around the world, we've seen the, the, the growth of pricing activities year on year. And what we also note in particular is the biggest emerging carbon pricing market in China, where five different sectors in China have already gone into carbon pricing and they have now brought forward to 2017 the date when the whole of China will have a carbon market. And the British government has worked very closely with the Chinese government in developing this carbon pricing process. And what we're very keen to see is that it can be merged with the European Union's carbon market. Now, that, that is a possibility that I've been to China recently to discuss with the Chinese government. There's a great enthusiasm for joining up. Of course, the European Union needs to put its own house in order so that we have a decent price on carbon. But once we've done that, and I think we'll achieve that by 2020, then we have the possibility of creating a carbon market jointly with, uh, with the Chinese uh, government. Now, there are many other parts of the world uh, also going into carbon pricing. And then I, I just want to add uh, this agreement that was reached in Paris, again in the sidelines, between the UK government and the USA government, to put together our Energy Africa policy that was developed during 2015, with their Power Africa policy that was developed at about the same time. So we've joined forces and made a commitment that by 2030 we will have rolled out to the 620 million people in Africa who are currently off-grid, their villages are off-grid, to roll out renewable energy plus energy storage plus microgrids into those villages. The commitment is to reach every village by 2030 provided that governments invite us to help them in this process. Now that in itself again, not only provides a massive boost to education and standards of living and well-being in Africa, but it also provides a new marketplace for the renewable energy goods. So I, I think when we add up all these new markets, you're going to find there's a great surge in demand and I'm believing that that surge in demand will itself be self-accelerating. Because as the demand goes up and production grows to meet demand, prices will continue to come down. And as prices come down and become increasingly more competitive, as the chairman referred to, we are going to find that the rollout of renewable energy against fossil fuel energy rollout will accelerate very rapidly. And that is the big opportunity going forward in time. Now, <clears throat> the IPCC, uh, bless their hearts, produce very, very lengthy documents. Uh, uh, they analyze uh, 10,000 odd, not odd, uh, very good publications. 
and they produce the, uh, their reports as a very thorough review of the best of climate science. And I'm just going to draw your attention to one graph out of their thousands of pages. And that graph simply shows the temperature rise since 1870, average for the planet, as a function of man-made carbon dioxide emissions going forward in time. And what, what you see in black is what we've already done. And what you see in blue is the maximum that we can emit in carbon dioxide going forward if we're going to stay below a 2 degree centigrade temperature rise. So this gives the notion of a carbon budget a reality. It says that is the maximum budget we're allowed. Now, 1.5 degrees centigrade, I haven't even got a curve corresponding to that, <coughs> means we cannot go beyond this point. So somewhere around here, we have to terminate in greenhouse gas emissions. That's the commitment that was reached by all countries in Paris. And that's the challenge to all of us to see that we achieve going forward in time. If we don't, if we carry on business as usual, the red curve shows the, the future behavior. And frankly, I don't think we'll go that far because the global economy will have collapsed before we get to that four and a half to five degrees centigrade temperature rise by the end of the century. And one of the things I do want to point out is we tend to look at the most likely outcome, which is the red line. But if you look at the red splurge, that represents the confidence li limit on the calculations. And so if you worry, as I do, about what is the 1% chance going forward in time uh, that we hit, say, 7 degrees centigrade, you'll see that that 7 degrees centigrade is up there by the end of the century as a possibility at that 1% limit. So we're, we're really dicing with the fate of, of our civilization as we go forward, if we don't manage these, uh, these lower curves. Now, just to convert that into emissions per annum, I'm going to give this to you on a very simple graph, first of all, because the next graph is a little more complicated. Right? So all I'm showing here is emissions per annum as a function of time from 1990 through to 2035, and the red curve is the forecast based on the international energy analysis figure, IEA figures uh, going forward in time. So that's the expectation which includes the relatively good behavior that's happened so far. And you'll see that it's beginning to plateau out, but the green curve is roughly speaking where we need to be. Now, that was roughly speaking, I'm now going to become more precise with the next graph. So again, I'm going to show you emissions per annum as a function of time, but the first graph is going to demonstrate what happens if we just take on board the nationally determined contributions in Paris, and then what we need to do to stay at 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. So this curve in yellow here is the total agreement in Paris put together. So the, the curve in yellow goes only up to 2030 because most countries only committed themselves to 2030. And then what, what has been done in this graph uh, by carbon budget accounting tool is just to accelerate downwards the reduction in emissions going forward in time on a fairly optimistic scale. And what you get there is then a temperature rise, a most likely temperature rise, amounting to 3 to 4 degrees centigrade in all. That figure of 2.7 degrees uh, that has got around is frankly a figment of imagination. This is a, a better estimate than that figure. Now, down here, we have the odds-on curve that we need to be on. The odds-on curve for managing 1.5 degrees centigrade. In other words, that's the 50-50 probability line for managing 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now you'll see that we're, we're looking at emissions from China, India, USA, European Union, etc., and land use change here. 
So what, what needs to change is all of these figures very dramatically, and by 2035, we need to be greenhouse gas neutral. That's with a 50-50 chance of 1.5 degrees. Now the blue curve and the red curve indicate the estimates 50-50 that we need to be on for the two degree centigrade world. Right, so I think you can see that we've got a chance of being on these two curves if what I described as this market self-accelerating the process of decarbonizing the global economy, taking over fossil fuels, if we've got, a, we've got a chance of doing that, but we have to accelerate quite by quite a big margin compared with where we were left with at the uh, end of the Paris Agreement. And I apologize for the complexity of this graph, but I happen to think it encapsulates everything that we need to be doing over the next 10 years. That decision in Paris is not the point to sit back and say, job done. We've got a lot of work going forward in time. Now, I'm not going to take you through all of this curve, but, uh, graph, but simply to say, the, the UK, and you may not really believe this, I don't think any other country has done as much on climate change, on a, uh, putting pressure on other countries, on actions at home, than the United Kingdom. And it just needs to be said. The United Kingdom, since 1997, has been ahead of the game and pulling other countries with us. I've joined the Foreign Office now. I was Chief Science Advisor. By the way, those other jobs you heard about, I have to give up. So. <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, this is very much a full-time job, 24-7. Um, joining the Foreign Office, the 100 approximately full-time equivalent climate attaches in our embassies around the world that were generated during that earlier period, 2005-2006, are still there. Uh, there's a big climate office in the Foreign Office. We see climate change as the biggest diplomatic challenge of our era. And we have been putting an enormous effort into this. I think I have made about 80 official country visits Chairman was quite right, spending more time abroad than in country here, basically because we've got such a sophisticated operation through our embassies around the world. Uh, we were able to move 20 climate attaches during quite a long period into China to assist them in evaluating CO2 emissions, but also in managing the transition to a cap and trade process. Mexico, we we had a Climate Change Act of Parliament in 2008 when we had all party agreement and that has been committed by all parties right up to the pre-election period in 2015. That Climate Change Act of Parliament committing Britain and future governments in Britain to 80% reduction by 2050, and by the way that still stands, uh, the government of Mexico imitated that in 2012. We moved seven climate attaches into Mexico to assist in that uh, transition process. So we are affecting and influencing and helping governments around the world to manage their nationally determined contribution statements and also to manage to roll out those, those contributions. And let me just point out very quickly we created our own international climate fund. You've all heard, I'm sure, of the Green Climate Fund based in Seoul. That has $10.2 billion, static dollars in it. Our own international climate fund was initially financed at £4 billion. It's now had another £6 billion in October 2015 added to it. So we have a £10 billion uh, international climate fund from Britain alone going into uh, developing countries, that's 20% of that has been used in the avoided deforestation program. And of the remainder, 40%, roughly, for adaptation of 40% for mitigation assistance to developing countries around the world. That's a very substantial budget, but let me stress, it means that we gain the trust of other countries in our negotiating stance. And that was a critical pathway to getting that, uh, that agreement in Paris. That's, that's the end of the sales pitch for the British action. Now, how about this new low carbon sector that you're all participating in? Well, here's the, the news about the, uh, the sector. First of all, 2014 
more renewable energy, primary energy source was installed than all other forms of energy source around the whole world. So we, we, I think it was 51%. But we finally passed that. And of course, it's the renewable energy sector that's on the exponential growth and in that process, knocking out the fossil fuel sector as it becomes more and more competitively priced, even without carbon pricing on, in the marketplace. Now, just look at the UK. We have 11,500 companies. This is the BIS stroke official uh, ONS uh, analysis, uh, uh, fairly recently put out. 11,500 companies employing over 460,000 people with a turnover which is around 120 billion pounds a year. That's an enormous new sector in the British economy. It's the fastest growing sector, 30% uh, in the last three years. So contributing to the economic growth of the UK, contributing to high employment levels in the UK is this new low carbon sector. We shouldn't be shy about it. We really need to speak it up as this new sector that is bound to continue to grow. And I do worry about people complaining. Of course, there will always be complaints, but please precede your complaint by acknowledging that this is the new growth sector in the UK economy. And of course, this is the reason for that growth. First of all, we had feed-in tariffs driving through more, much more expensive technologies into the marketplace. But as those feed-in tariffs create the big new market, we see the fall in prices. And the fall in prices is not just for photovoltaic installation, for land-based wind, uh, modeled batteries, <coughs> and in particular, the cost of LEDs has come down even faster than the cost of photovoltaic installation. So what, what you see is this the mature markets of fossil fuel technologies are now being challenged by the new markets of renewable energy coming through into the marketplace. Now, do, can we sit back and, and let this all happen through the private sector? Well, I, I don't think we can, and for the last three years I've been working on a publicly funded surge in rd and Research Development and Demonstration Activity, to back up what the private sector needs. If you like, to de-risk new technologies to emerge into the private sector and hence into the marketplace. And so we, a group of us, and you'll see that I've brought with me some, some rather well-known figures as co-authors on this, we set up uh, what was called the Global Apollo Program. It was launched in June this year um, and it got quite a bit of publicity around the world. I suppose principally because David Attenborough was our public face for the launch of this program. David Attenborough was invited by President Obama to the White House and was interviewed by President Obama. That interview is on the blog site. And in that interview, Attenborough directly says to him, you should join this program. And Obama says, of course we will. And of course what then happens is that it, it means it rolls out very quickly. Now, th this is the primary intention of this program, is to put these technologies onto the marketplace in a competitive way uh, um, to, to be able to uh, eliminate the fossil fuel uh, uh, marketplace. Now, in the Global Apollo program, we said that all of the research should go into the areas in white, um, but as this merged into, in Paris, the first day in Paris, uh, this merged into a new name. Mission Innovation it became, and uh, it was Prime Minister Modi who provided the alternative title. He didn't like the name Apollo. Um, and so we have Mission Innovation launched in Paris. Countries were invited, and I spent a lot of time traveling around the world, to join the program by announcing they would double their publicly funded research development and demonstration activity in these areas by 2020. And we've got 20 nations uh, representing about 80% of global research effort. 20 nations have joined, including China, India, the United States, Japan, and Britain. And this launch means 
that we have a very good chance that the rollout will be completed at the Clean Energy Ministerial in San Francisco on June the 1st and 2nd. And a lot of my effort is now going in to see that that is a successful launch. Now you will see there the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. Bill Gates approached us and said, I've got a billion dollars I can put down on the table of my own money. This is not philanthropic money. He said, this is an investment to see that the rollout of these new technologies gets into the marketplace. And by the time he arrived in Paris, he had 26 billionaire friends, each promising to put down a similar sum of money. So we've got around $20 billion of venture capital promised to assist in the rollout of the new technologies uh, um, into uh, companies that already exist or into new SMEs that might emerge. Now, I'm just going to finish by running through some of the aspects of the new world that we're moving into. First of all, solar energy has only really begun to roll out. The, the deserts of the world still need to be utilized as energy generators. And well, <coughs> we all know that Prime Minister Modi is very enthusiastic about this program because he wants to roll out, he announced shortly after his election, 100 gigawatts of solar energy by 2022 in the deserts in India. South Africa very recently announced this uh, uh, 9.6 gigawatts in the, in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa. We are going to see countries joining this rush into photovoltaics around the world in order to meet those nationally determined contributions that we've stated. People ask me, what, what can we do about energy storage? And I, I like to show this as an example. This is not in the marketplace. Right? This is an energy storage technique developed by Professor Heindel, who's a mining engineer. And using standard mining techniques, he demonstrates how you can take a flat piece of land with a farmer's amount of soil above granite and simply cut a cylinder of granite out of the ground below. The piece of land we're looking at here, that's uh, cylindrical, is 150, sorry, 150 meters diameter and about 250 meters deep. And that stores a gigawatt hour of electricity. When you have excess electricity, you simply up pump the cylinder with water underneath the granite and of course the weight of the granite means that instead of up pumping 2,000 meters into a dam to get the power to drive the turbine, you simply pump this up 120 meters and you've got the energy stored in the mass of the granite. So this, this means that in areas that are flat, desert lands, etc., you could store a, a significant amount of energy. So this is a, 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 an idea that needs to be developed and taken through into the marketplace. But obviously it's a game changer for intermittent energy sources. I think we mustn't take our eye off transport and I'm now going to talk to you about the, the most difficult transport area. Ground transport is going to go onto the electricity grid or it's going to go into hydrogen fuel cells with energy stored as hydrogen when there's excess. What about air transport? Well, there's a British company, Varialift, who've uh, designed the airship shown here. It's an airship and inside this aluminium shell, they've grasped a nettle here. They've created a very heavy airship, the only company that's thought of doing this. But it has a tremendous advantage. Inside this are 12 helium bags, a helium cylinder, and a compressor. And when you've loaded this up, uh, by the way, this is big. It's 170 meters long. It's about 80 meters wide, 70 meters wide. Uh, but it will lift 1,500 tons of freight simply by releasing helium into those bags. Uh, it, it's got a compressor, so you want to bring it down, you compress the helium back into the cylinder. 
but it's also got a crane on board, and so you can fly over the tomato fields of Spain, uh, pick up in a container, a container full of tomatoes into the hold, fly to Sainsbury's and Tesco's, and lower the container onto their depots. How does it translate without burning fossil fuel? Well, it's got a big enough intersection with solar energy, it's covered with photovoltaics, and its engines are electric. So basically, it flies using photovoltaic energy at, at 30,000 feet, very low air resistance, and it can do 340 kilometers an hour. It's not a sluggish uh, means of transporting freight. The, this, I would suggest, is a breakthrough technology that once it reaches the marketplace, will be totally transitional. Imagine what this would do in Africa, where ground transport is really rather poor. You suddenly are in the position of the mobile phone. This is my equivalent to the mobile phone for uh, air freight, but why not also for moving people around? And then I, I finally come to second generation biofuels. I was flown up to the northeast of Brazil on one of my many trips where they showed me this amazing biofuel plant, uh, which looks like any kind of oil refinery, except that there's no energy input to the whole plant. The plant is run entirely by the methane produced in the first stage of digesting the leafy material from sugarcane baled up as the, the sugar cane is removed to make sugar. They take the leafy material and convert it into alcohol and it's about 20% cheaper than converting the sugar cane into alcohol. So you, you've got a, a totally uh, energy free process. It's actually negative carbon dioxide production. Now I, I think we're heading towards a, an extremely exciting period for innovation and wealth creation for the whole world as we manage this enormous challenge that we've been set. Thank you.